Hey guys, welcome back to the Barrels Fit Podcast. I am here today with my athletic director, Jess Kiltz. Hello, Jess, how are you? Hey, Pete, how you doing? I'm good, thanks so much for joining us. I can't believe that this is the first time you're on the podcast. It's been, how many years? I'm, I'm just shocked that I'm worthy to be on the podcast. So God. I'm extremely grateful um, to be asked. <laughs> because how many years ago did you first start at Forest? Because when you first came, you were just literally doing personal training with your clients. And I think that was probably three years ago. It was 2019, yes, because I was living in LA, but moved to Chicago and then moved back to LA from Chicago. And it was 2019 when I moved back. So yeah, it was shortly after that, that I started, I was just doing personal training. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember, and just so uh, you guys are listening now, like Jess came in and immediately I knew she was a very, a very talented uh, coach. Um, she was just doing personal training at the time. Uh, and then of course the pandemic happened and everybody kind of like scattered a little bit. And then when we came back in with the progression in the gym and the, the growth of the gym, uh, we needed to bring in some, some, some great new coaches. And of course, um, Jess was a, was a complete no brainer. And we were lucky enough to kind of like, you know, it was good timing for us both. And Jess was um, able to commit a little bit more to the club and so forth. And um, it went from, would you be interested in being more involved to being the, the fucking athletic director of the club um, in a relatively short amount of time. So I'm thrilled uh, that you are doing this, uh, this position. I'm thrilled that you're at the club. Uh, you know, I love you. You know, uh, I think your quality. So I, I want everyone to know uh, a little bit more about you, like where you came from, what your history in the fitness industry is, because a lot of people don't know you have been doing this for a very long time, despite how young you look. Um, you're kind of uh, <clears throat> you're kind of long in the tooth in the industry, a bit like me. So let's go back to the beginning. How did you get into fitness? Um, what was your you know what spurred that passion? Um, how did that passion evolve? And how did we get to where we are today? Uh, well, thank you for that intro, Pete. Love it. Um, I, my journey into fitness actually didn't start in fitness. It actually started in the medical world. Um, I knew from a very young age, uh, due to some things that I had experienced that I wanted to be an EMT, a paramedic, something that had to do with like adrenaline and helping people. And so I knew right out of high school that I wanted to go be an EMT, for instance, so I went and put myself through school on that um, as young as 19 years old and then uh, became licensed in the state of New York where I'm from and then moved to pretty soon after that moved to San Francisco and I got my first job in Kaiser, Kaiser Emergency Room, believe it or not. So second busiest ER in San Francisco. So I pretty much had my ass handed to me right from the go, but in a way that I was so excited to, to, to be there. I was very wet behind the ears, but... I was at that, um, that hospital for six and a half years, and I've got stories for a whole other podcast with that. Ended up transferring down to LA because I wanted to um, just be in a little warmer climate and I wanted a little change, had some friends that wanted to do it as well. And I started getting a little into the acting business as, as some of us do as we come down here, um, hopeful and uh, with big dreams. But I was still doing um, my medical stuff, which I very much loved. But, you know, as one could imagine, it was very physically, emotionally and mentally draining. So I, I did pull away from it a little bit and I started to venture into veterinary technician world, believe it or not, because I love mm -hmm. animals a lot. And um, that's a whole other scene, but uh, Tiger King comes to mind and that's pretty accurate. So we'll save it for a <laughs> But um, after that, I, I started to get into the idea of training because I was going through actually a tough time in my life. And I had a friend that worked for Beachbody, believe it or not. Oh, Beachbody, right. Yeah. yeah. And she was like, you know, do you want to be in, in one of these like strength test groups? You know, but the only thing is, is like, you need to get your act together. You need to show up five days a week. You're going to get your food provided for you though. And all the things. So I was like, yeah, sure. And so I decided to do it. I had to drive to Santa Monica five days a week from, you know, the East side or whatever. And, um, Believe it or not, it actually, I had always worked out. Like I, I always worked out on and off my whole life, but nothing with any consistency or worth per se. So I, and I was very athletic. So it, I really sank my teeth into that. And it really, I mean, I, I would venture to say it saved, saved my life in a weird way. Like, 
what what did that look like the beach body thing what, you were like teaching like group classes to camera that people would then follow or well i wasn't even teaching it i wasn't a trainer i was still an EMT. you were just, do, and, you were just doing beach body yeah i was doing it i was like an actual uh i was gonna say victim but <laughs> it's like one right, of the right. subjects and uh, it was a strength, pretty, pretty much a strength program that was five days a week. And I was eating the food that they gave me. And um, my body had amazing results. It helped me emotionally, physically, mentally, all the, all the things that we know fitness does for your, you know, for you. Yeah. And I had a trainer at the time that was taking me through this. So she was like, why don't you go and be a trainer? She's like, you already have this medical background. Like, she's like, you're so right. good at it. And so long story short, I did end up getting such good results that they actually ended up using me in the infomercial at the oh, end. Oh, really? Oh, my God. We have, to, we have to get hold of that. I know. Every now and again, uh, um, it'll be on like in a hotel, a hotel room, right. like some infomercial, and you'll see me doing flips with Tony Horton. But <laughs> that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, uh, from there, I, I decided to walk down that path. Like I was... I was having hardships in my other ventures. So I was like, well, let me just walk down the path. And, and in truth, I never looked back. And that was about 10 years ago. I went, you know, got my certification and pretty much started with a little boutique gym right here in LA called Function 5 Fitness. Um, the owner was a, a, a Muay Thai professional fighter, a, a female. And I had a friend that worked there and I got a job and it was a, like on the brand eighth. And, um, that's where my fitness journey pretty much started officially. And when you say, because people always ask this question, like what was the initial certification you got? Was it NASM or was it something different? It was. It was NASM. Started with NASM. Okay. That was the basic. And then, and then from there, so you got your NASM, you're working in this gym in LA. And then, because I know you're a Strong First coach, and for people don't, who don't know what Strong First is, Strong First is one of the primary or probably the primary kettlebell um, instruction uh, authorities mm-hmm. on the planet um yes. so at what stage did you decide to kind of evolve from you know an asim certified instructor working in this gym to being something more than that well the small boutique gym that i mentioned uh the owner and all the instructors there were actually strong for certified on top of it, it was a box it was a muay thai slash strength training gym small mm-hmm. little thing um, and all the coaches there were just like leveled up. I mean, they were athletes themselves in their sport. They were all strong, strong for certified. I mean, a few of them were, had their CSCS. So I really didn't even have, not that I, not that I didn't want it, but I didn't even have a choice. Like my boss was, she was just like, if you want to teach these classes and you want to hang with the big kids, pretty much, she's like, we're going to teach you how to lift. And we're going to teach you how to do kettlebells. You will teach others under our guide. And she's like, and you will go be certified or, or you're, you can leave <laughs> pretty much. Cool. Yeah. And so I had a, like, to me, I feel like blessed that I got to have that experience right out of the gate versus, you know, I'm not bashing Equinox or anything like that, but having to go to that kind of traditional route that a lot of uh, people do where they have to start at the bottom of the totem pole and work their way up. I mean, I was at the bottom of the totem pole, but I got to rise in the ranks under like highly qualified coaches and people who truly deeply cared about the the health and the fitness of, of others. And namely our, our students that came to the gym and they just wanted me to be my best so I could teach my best. And I feel yeah. like a rock star that I got to start that way. Yeah. But what do you think? Because I know a lot of fighters, a lot of fight training gyms love kettlebells and love kettlebell work. And there's definitely a, a connection between like strong first and the, and the fight world. Why do you yeah. think that connection exists? What is it about kettlebells that transfers well to the fight game? Well, I mean, as I understand it from my kettlebell training, and kettlebells have been around for centuries. I mean, starting in like what the, the Russian armed forces used to carry around big hunks of iron because it was too hard to carry around like dumbbells and barbells right. and all these things back then. They had, you know, these soldiers, and I know very little about like, you know, Russian army history, but right. I do know at the very least that they did carry these hunks of iron around so that the soldiers could do some strength and conditioning all in one, which is what, what's so great about kettlebells. It's like, it's just this little gym 
in one that piece kind of hybrid, of yeah, that kind of hybrid result of strength and conditioning. Yeah. 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 So it's been around for centuries. You think of some of those strong men, old time, like video or old time pictures of like, you know, somebody strong arming this big piece of like what looked like a fused together piece of iron with balls right. on and, you know, and kind of doing like a Turkish get up style movement. So, so those are all in the pictures of like the strong first, uh, history and which was fascinating. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my knowledge of where it came from. I mean, it's been around for forever and it's yes. still so highly effective in training some of the, you know, armed forces and fighters. I think, I, and I think a lot of it, like, as you know, like so much of kettlebell work is about the hips and about hip explosion. And I just yeah. think that transfers so well to the fight game because, you know, most, yeah. most power in boxing and, and, uh, and wrestling comes from the hips. Yeah. So I think, you know, not that you don't train the hips um, in traditional strength training, but there's a more dynamic hip explosion with kettlebell work that you don't necessarily get um, with, with other work, unless you're specifically training and using a barbell in a very specific way. Like we can talk about power clean, we can talk about jumping, we can yeah. talk about hip thrusts and that kind of stuff. But um, the kettlebell is a very, you know, it allows you to to bring that hip explosion hip explosion into a, a repeatable dynamic uh, event. So you can you you know you can do high reps, you can do low reps, whatever it is. But you can really emphasize very clearly the the, the position and the movement of the hips um, in various different ranges and in very different very various different ways. And you know the kind of multiple plane positions that you can get in with a kettlebell because it is it is so um, so malleable and so manipulative. You can use it in so many different ways and you can get your shoulders in so many different positions. Yep. Um, it just seems to be a very, and I hate the word because it's like thrown around left, right, and center, but it's a very functional tool. I knew you were um, going to say that. <laughs> yeah. That, that, it's true, it is. It is. It's just they, specialized, which is what I liked about it. It was it was more unique at the time. So even, even though it's been around for centuries, even just 10 years ago, I you know, you look on well, social media wasn't even like that big even then, but you know, a lot of people weren't doing it or if they were doing it, they were doing it improperly. And I really loved how highly specialized it was and that you, if you really wanted to do it right, you had to be specially trained. And I just, I loved that element to it. Cause like, right. I mean, I'd venture to say, you know, especially strong for us has a slightly militant value to it, which, you know, I can, I can kind of adhere to a little bit. Like I, I love, I love certain elements in the strength world being like strict and doing things perfectly yes. or, or like working to get them perfect, even though there's nothing, no such thing as perfection. But um, I really loved that about kettlebells. Too. Well, I think that's a good point because there's a problem right now with you can make serious stuff fun. There's a difference between making serious stuff fun and just doing silly shit, which is fun. Yes. And right now we're in a position where there are so many things in the industry that's just silly shit. And people yes. do it because it's fun and it makes them sweat, blah, 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 blah. Not realizing that, okay, yeah, you had some fun, but it didn't really get you any results. It didn't get you stronger. It didn't help anything. Um, so yeah. kind of pointless. Whereas, you know, if you teach the, the foundations and the specifics, I'm going to strip with that first, you can then make things fun based on that strong foundation. But, you know, it, it, you can't just throw shit at the fan and like, you know, have fun. Yeah, I have clients that send me videos of people flipping kettlebells in the air and catching them. And that's all fine and good. And it's obviously an amazing display of athleticism, but is it going to get you results? Is it something I'm going to teach you, especially in a virtual platform? Hell no, I'm not doing that. Right. I, I've always <laughs> hated I've learn always, how to deadlift. <laughs> I've always hated like parlor tricks. And that's, that's the problem with Instagram. That's the problem with social media in general. Like people put parlor tricks on. I remember once I had a client in, the, the, you know, she could barely she, we were doing jump rope she could barely jump rope and then she found this person online who's doing all these tricks like i want to do this and like okay we have x amount of time to condition you for this thing how much time do you think we should waste learning tricks on the rope it's just exactly. not a good use of your time you're like oh, okay so are you ready to train six days a week oh you're not okay that's what i thought right. <laughs> right. you know right now you're yeah. giving me two days and like when at what point like am i to teach you that yeah just... unfortunately what gets gets the best results is doing the boring stuff a lot okay. oh yeah <laughs> over and over but just in different ways you know and different yeah. ways for different people and 
you know, nothing, the, the most effective things out there are, yeah, truly the most boring. <laughs> right, right. So with the strong first, um, how many levels of strong first is there? Is there, because I know with certifications that I've done in the past, it's like level one, level two, level three, how many levels of strong first are there? Well, it, for the kettlebell program, there's only two, which doesn't sound like that dynamic or whatever, but um, you go through your strong first level one skills and it's a three day, you know, on a weekend, like grueling. It is grueling. I mean, you're there um, day into the night, Friday, Saturday, and then on Sunday, you do you have to do your snatch test, which is 100 snatches uh, in, five, in under five minutes. And then yeah. level two is just kind of like a, like you have to test your level one skills and then you have to demonstrate these level two and all these things you have to train for them before you even get to the seminar. It's not like, right. I, I hate to call it even a seminar because it's not right. like you don't learn, you learn a ton while you're there, but it's under the thought that you, you've learned a ton before you even got there. Like you have to yes. train to get there, which is yes. also, you know, it's, it's like a rite of passage. I, I just love the strong force isn't just like a certification. It's kind of a way of life. And that's um, right. I liked about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you did the level one on the level two. So yeah, I'm level two certified um, at the moment and strong force has other programs like barbell now body weight, which I hear is like a, its own particular, you know, grueling set of skills that you have to go through. So I haven't ventured into any of that, but I easily would suggest anybody to go to any of those certifications. I, I, I've done a lot of certifications in my career over the last 10 years and um, hands down strong first is um, the best and the most valuable. And I've trained about seven people to go get their strong first at this point. And every single one of them has said the same thing. So, yeah. And just so people know, who was the guy that started it? Uh, his name is Pavel. Pavel oh. Satsuline, which yeah. I don't know if I said that exactly right, but it's like a I think that's right. I think that's but right. yeah, he's he's kind of the com hey comrades, um, you know, czar of the of kettlebell training. <laughs> yeah, and he's um, anybody who's in the industry knows that he's he's been around for a long time. Um, you know, you'll have seen his name sprinkled in strength training discussions yeah. for for, yep. for a long long time. Right. He's he's Paul Quinn and some of those Godfathers. Right. Oh yeah. 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 He's so. he's a he's a real icon in the in the industry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm excited. Uh, you know that we have that kind of strong first presence at the gym with you and uh, our new trainer Jake. Right, he's a uh, strong first. Yeah, yeah. Right? Our new trainer, our new strength conditioning coach. He's level one, and uh, yeah, he's super pumped to help bring the kettlebell uh, into more light here at the gym. And so it's nice. It's always nice to have it. it what I was saying about strong first being a way of life. It's it's kind of one of those certifications that. Uh, once you see that on a resume or somebody tells it that you are, it's almost a no, no brainer. You know, like right. for instance, I didn't have any job prospects when I moved from LA to Chicago and there was a private strength, uh, strong first Facebook page. And I was like, Hey, all oh, I, I moved to Chicago. I don't have any job. I had a job in a day like that. That's great. Yeah. That was like, first. like, so that's just like the community that builds. Yeah, it is. It is one of those certs that, that just immediately gives you a little bit of credibility. Yeah. And, um, you know, this, I get this question all the time. Like, I want to be a personal trainer. What certification should I get? Mm -hmm. And of course, you're forced to kind of say, well, you really need to get your NASA, even though it's kind of useless. Right. Not that it's useless, but, you know, it's kind of useless. Um, and then, and then you're really saying like, but that's just the foundation. And from there you should do X, Y, Z and right. strong, first, strong first is definitely like one of those X, Y, Z, like you should probably, you know, look to something like that after you get your NASM because it does the, the problem with something like NASM is it does not prepare you for the real world. It does not prepare you for, you know, training people in a gym. It does not train you for a lifestyle, a philosophy, or anything like that. It doesn't it's train just, you for proper programming necessarily, which is my biggest. Certainly, does, certainly doesn't do that. It's just general information on anatomy and and health. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's a there's definitely a big gap, and like you know, we're we're working to try and bridge that gap. I know other companies are on you know just getting a basic certification and then becoming a successful coach and what that really what that really means mm -hmm. um so once you, you 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 became a strong first coach and at what point did you decide to become a powerlifter because again not a lot of people know that you were a competitive 
powerlifter at one point yeah. in your life and that you still yeah. kind of dabble in that world? Mm -hmm. uh, it's surprisingly at the same gym and almost exactly at the same time I was training kettlebells. I mean, my, my boss and the head coach, uh, his name is Tyler. He was, uh, she, she was like, Hey, you've been here for long enough. Now I wasn't kettlebell certified yet. I wasn't, I was any, nothing but personal trainer certified and just working under these people, um, and learning all I could. Um, and so my boss was like, okay, well, our head coach Tyler wants to start teaching you how to you know, work with the barbell so that that way you can help our students. Like, are you interested? And then I was like, yeah, sure. And so I started training under him with him, you know, like a lot of gyms and like our gym here, the, the open gym hours are two to four. And that was, those were pretty much just turned into like the trainer hours where the trainers train themselves. And so I was training under him and doing those lifts and doing a program, just learning all the technique. And my Yet again, my body just really loved it. I loved it. I loved learning. I was strong. I was getting so strong. I just loved that. And um, he one day he was like, "Hey, do you do you want to do a powerlifting meet?" I was like, "Sure. I have no idea what that entails, but let's do it." And yeah. so I, you know, trained and went to my first powerlifting meet. And on my very first powerlifting meet, I qualified for nationals. Wow! So to have found something like that out of the gate that like you're good at is something that some people I think strive for possibly forever. Like I just happened to fall into these things that I was truly passionate about. And then to be good at it, like right out of the gate, even though, you know, it's hard work. I'm not saying none of it, it's not hard work, but you know, to, to have qualified for nationals in my very first meet was just like, I didn't even know it, but he was like, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is incredible. And it's also, you know, one of the things I love about you and I love about what's happened in the industry in the last 10 years is this influx of, of, of women who are, you know, talented, strong, passionate. Um, and it's just become so much more accessible than it used to be. Yeah. Um, because if you'd have said, like, when I was first going to gyms, like, I didn't know any female powerlifters at all. Um, right. and, and if you did, they were, you know, they were in a certain stereotype. Yeah. Whereas sure. now it's just like, I mean, we have so many people at the gym, you know, so many females at the gym interested in powerlifting. Mm -hmm. And it, I just think it's such an empowering sport. Um, and we are really redefining, um, redefining female participation in these, in these sports, um, whether it be powerlifting, Olympic lifting, CrossFit, whatever it is yeah. to see, you know, it's exciting because it's not that it's untested, but it's untested in such a large demographic. Like it used to be a very specific thing and with very specific people. Yeah. Now it's becoming more of a general thing. Yeah. And you're really seeing, you know, the gap thinning between what men can do and what oh, women sure. can do. The lines are blurring. The lines sure. are blurring because you, you, it was just so untested before. And now, you know, weights that you would think weren't possible for, for females are now like being smashed um so yeah. it's an exciting it's an exciting time and it's really encouraging to see um i think we have more females right now interested in powerlifting and weightlifting than we do males um yeah. i definitely i know that's true in the lift uh class so it's yeah. it's kind of it's kind of fascinating to me and exciting to me because it's it's really tearing down a lot of old um stigmas and stereotypes that were very frustrating for any of us that were working in the industry. Like, you know, the whole don't lift weights, don't get big and bulky, don't uh, be feminine, all this kind of shit that we've all had to deal with. We've all been through right. like frustrating for, for women, frustrating for coaches. Um, and you, you still have a lot of idiots pushing that. Fortunately, you know, through the work that you're doing, through the work that people like you are doing, through the work that gyms like us are doing, I think we can, uh, hopefully put those put those stereotypes to, to rest and, and and move forward in a much more um you know just a much more uh, it's happening and it's been happening. i'm and i'm so i'm so pleased to be a part of this profession during this time you know right. I, like knowing myself i would you know i would have been so frustrated 20 years ago even let's say where it's just like you know, women's role in gyms, if any, was on the treadmill or right. in the, you know, yoga studio or uh, well, the you Tracy know, the Tracy Anderson thing of like two pound weights. Uh, you know, I saw the other day was like 
um, Robert Downey Jr. doing a Tracy Anderson like banded, like skipping around. I was like, dude, you're a fucking Iron Man. What the uh, fuck? Are you I doing? know, right? Will you just at least pretend to like the Iron Man outside of Iron Man world? Yeah, it, it, it has been su- such an amazing journey. And yeah, frustrating too, because we're having to do these myth busting things all along the way. But, you know, I don't mind being that person that can help bust those myths of yes. like, oh, yeah. by eating or lifting these weights, it's not like you're going to get bulky just by looking at the weight. It, in fact, I usually like to shoot them down in a, in, a, in a decent way of like, do you know how hard it is to gain muscle? You right. know how, how right. much food do you have to eat to like, yeah. to get, to get, you know, bulky. And then I usually like to ask them, well, well what does bulky mean to you? You know, who, can you give me an example of a person that you know, that looks bulky that you're like, ew. And I said, because when I, any of my female clients put a little, even just the slightest bit of arm muscle on, I'll tell you the females around them at their jobs flock to them. I'm like, Oh my God, what are you doing? Your arms are so jacked. Yes. And, yeah. and they love it. They love it. And so they're like, so tell me again, what, what does bulky mean? Do you mean, do you mean fat? Like, cause anybody, right. what do you mean? Yeah. anybody in the wrong fueling plan and you can make somebody yeah. their undesirable look, but no. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of that, a lot of that is, is Hollywood's fault. I know, I know you have some experience in that world. I have some experience in that world. And it's honestly, they say one thing, but secretly underhand there, they want another. So they'll, they'll they'll champion female empowerment and they'll say, you know, they'll produce movies that are about female empowerment. But under that script, there's like a, don't get it too bulky. Don't get it too right. big. It's like, yeah. it's like. Um, Look at so-and-so's diet that she did to trim down for a block. Right. Block. It's all about. Right. How about talk about her training program? It was to get her. Right. You know the deltoids that you see on screen so she actually looks like a superhero how about that <laughs> yeah exactly it's 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 incredibly frustrating but yeah thankfully it it is changing and you know like i said it's great to see people working to change it and to you know just rewrite the script a little bit um so with your powerlifting jess um how long did you do it for are you still competitive are you still wanting to be competitive or what's happening <laughs> Well, I know a lot of people in this profession that like retired from program from uh, powerlifting, but then, you know, seven, seven years later, they find themselves back on the platform. So I'm never going to say never. Um, I did it competitively for eight years and won the medals and, you know, all the things. But like, I, it wasn't until my last competition, which was right before I moved back to LA from Chicago. It was, so that was about three years ago now. And it was my best meet to date. And if anything, it was a meet that I came back from after some, you know, random debilitating back pain. So I just needed to like prove to myself that I could get back to the platform. And lo and behold, I had my best meet with my best numbers. And it just felt like it was time to move on. So not to say that I wasn't going to do, um, powerlifting movements or anything like that. And it was never any, it was nothing I said outwardly, like, yeah, I'm going to retire now, but I moved back to LA and, you know, just started getting into just working and being in a community that I really loved and, and, and getting super busy. And I didn't have the time to, to dedicate to powerlifting right. training, to be honest. Yeah, that, was the that was my question when you were competitive and when you were winning all these, I think the medals behind you, by the way, I can see. Yeah. Way. Those are my medals right. behind me that my partner framed for me for my birthday last year, which is just, Very and it, cool. I, I, it, you know, I don't cry that easily, but I sh- shed a little tear for that one. Before. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah, when, you were competing, when you were competing, presumably you were kind of exclusively doing strength training for powerlifting. Yes. And um, what did that look like? What did your weekly program look like? Uh, it was definitely four to five days of, you know, strenuous actual barbell work. And then a day or two of accessory work, like GPP, general physical awareness, like doing some cardio, but like more power cardio, like, uh, uh, sleds and the airdyne. And, um, were you supplementing with kettlebell work or not? Yeah. I I would do kettlebell swings for time and stuff like that, because that obviously translated really well. I would include kettlebells into my actual warmups for my barbell just because they prepared my body explosively so well for doing my 
do my strength work. So yeah, I would it's like six days a week, you know, upwards of two hours with the exception of my GPP days, which could be an hour, but like this, you know, cause you're lift heavy weight. You have to rest upwards of like five minutes. So that would this, be like two hour this, training. This, this is always the hardest thing with truly strength training in a, in a class environment is yeah. people find it very hard to rest. People, yeah think that working out means like running around and like getting their heart rate up and doing this and doing that and so moving and people's like attention deficit is so bad that they can't just like lift and then just sit down and do nothing and i was that person i have a a, a small story i always tell my coach who was a man of very few words but when i first started lifting i'd be like you know i'd get done with a set and i'd be like dancing around i'd be like should i be doing something in between and he would just look at me and be like that's not optimal Right. It's not. I mean, <laughs> and then he, yeah. just, he would he, just say soon enough, you're going to be lifting weight heavy enough that you're not going to want to get back to that bar any sooner than five minutes. Right. He's like, be patient. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny because even like in build, if I program like a three minute rest, you look around and see people doing sit ups, they're doing push ups. Oh, yeah. They're like, oh my God, what are you, what are you doing? So true. But it's yeah, the resting is the hardest parts for some people. Yeah, sure. really I remember that those days. Nobody, when... nobody, nobody can sit down and do nothing anymore. Like even oh. like they have to have their phone or that there has to be like something to do or a conversation or something. Nobody yeah. can just sit and be at peace with themselves anymore. Yeah, just sit and reflect on the weights and be present in the room. And yeah, right. it's it's a beast we all have to we all fall victim to. But yeah, my pet peeve is just like. Somebody just does this nice, like pretty looking bench press and they go, go plop over onto the bench and they hunch over into their worst position, looking at their phone. And right. I'm just yeah. like, across the room, like, man, first yeah. of all, sit up straight, <laughs> like, yeah. stop reversing all the things we're doing. I mean, and that when we're talking about time, like that can be the difficult thing about being a competitive power after being in that sport is workouts do take a long time because the rest periods have to be long. Um, and I think that's why most people, like you were saying, like once things got really busy for you, it was hard to fit in because it's not something you can just go in and do in 40 minutes. Like, because then you're, you know, you're just disrespecting the discipline. So you need to be very respectful of rest periods and understand that it's going to take a long amount of time. And it isn't something you can just go in and bang out in 40 minutes. It's just uh, that, that the whole sport is just a huge lesson in patience and uh, it's very hard. Uh, a lot of times and yes. you know you'll, you'll fail and you'll, you'll have wins and you'll have fails you have all the above but yet it, it was an amazing lesson but yeah i just don't have the time or the energy for that matter for like two hour workouts anymore <laughs> yeah 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 so um so you left chicago you come back to la um you would train just doing personal training for a while with with clients yeah um and then of course the pandemic we all know what fucking happened there yeah yeah. and then you know you're back at first now as as our athletic director um and as well as that i know you have like other stuff going on i know you're you're currently chris hemsworth's best friend uh i'm what you're chris Chris hemsworth's best friend oh yeah my i'm i'm in with thor these days with thor and and you work on this new centerfit um program and I think you're the first female strength coach for Centerfit. Is that, that correct? Is correct. That is what I'm being touted as. Um, you know, I can cater to women and to men. And uh, yeah, so that's that's my title is that I'm the first female strength coach to be brought on to Center. I mean, I know there's already females on the app, but, um, you know, they do other specialties like, you know yoga and other very important things. And, and I, so I was brought on as that. And interestingly enough, the trainer that was the person she, the trainer from the beach body days, the one that made me go be a trainer was the name. It was the person that threw my name in the hat for this project. And I got, Oh wow! It. and what's crazy is like when we did the filming her and her husband who have since gotten into production so they they have a, a company called Fit Life Productions where they now are behind the camera and film you know people that need to to have uh, productions and Center uses them and so uh, her name is Rachel she's the one that threw my name in the hat for this and I got it so it was nuts how it was almost like ten years to the day literally on Facebook memories when we were yeah. filming 
that I reunited with her after all these years. And that Facebook memory came up that said that I was starting the Beachbody venture way back when. And then it came to full circle that her and I are doing this together. And it was, it was really next level weird. <laughs> well, congratulations. And yeah, it's, it's funny how life is like that. Like I've had so many instances where, you know, a chance meeting like years ago led to something in the future that you just never could have known at the time would happen. No. Um, and it just, it just makes you realize how important it is to, to do things and to meet people and to take those chances. Because even if that something doesn't happen in the moment and right away, you know, yeah. you remember like I, there's people I remember from years ago that I'd work with again, or that I'd give an opportunity to if, if I had the chance because of the talent that I saw in them back then. So I think sometimes if we don't get like rewarded for something right away, sometimes we like dejected, but it's yeah. worth remembering that, you know, those, 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 those good things you do can be, um, can be rewarded like way in the future because people so remember. Yeah. It's so hard. There's no way for you to know, but yeah, being a, one of the older coaches of the gym, um, which is not my favorite thing, but at the same time, I have this knowledge and I'll see some of these younger coaches and I, you know, I just tell them, I, I say, you know, find something that you personally are interested in that you do yeah. really well in this industry and then go and be a specialist, specialize in something. Like I, I wanted to specialize in kettlebells and barbell work. And I tell you, you never have to look for work a day in your life because people are going to come to you right. because you're yeah. so good at what you do Yeah, that they're going to come to you because they want to learn. I think, I think that is one of the problems now in the industry is people think they have to be good at everything and they become a very general trainer. So it's like, and, and honestly, in the beginning, like I, I definitely had this, this issue where you're a nutritionist, you're a yeah. weight loss specialist, you're a hypertrophy specialist, you're a boxing specialist, you're all these different, but it's like, nobody can be specialized in all those things. Right. Pick right. a lane, like so, pick the lane you want to be in and get really good at it. Um, because and like, I love like, that about our coaching staff that we have a very right. diverse staff of, uh, of specialties. And I, I love being able to be like, Oh, well, that's not my, that's not my wheelhouse, but I, I totally have one of my coaches that yes. easily could coach you through that. And I like that. I think that that promotes, you know, um, it's support from within our walls that we right. have a diverse crowd of people with all different specialties. I don't want to know it all. I mean, in a perfect world, if I could just know everything, that would be lovely. But like, I'd rather be really good at a couple things that yeah. people can see me for. And I would easily pass you off to somebody else that knows better. Yeah. Yeah. You know? 100%. Yeah. So with the, with the, um, with the center fit thing, mm -hmm. you know, I, I saw this, you know, obviously this trend during the pandemic of people and we, we did it as well, like doing these online, like at home workouts, because obviously people couldn't go to gyms anymore and they wanted to get a workout in and they wanted to follow a program at home. And of course we saw, you know, we see, we see what's happened with Peloton, like they exploded and now it's like all kind of like tumbling down. Yeah. Um, what's what's kind of different about the Cenefit uh, program and what what their their kind of goals are now that people are back in in gyms and stuff? How does that work? Well, they you know speaking of diversity, they have a diverse group of of coaches on the app too, but they also do like you know nutrition stuff and mindfulness and yoga, but also like hit stuff and strength stuff, and you can do guided workouts or you can just do a workout program and go to the gym and do it yourself. You know, right. you have to do some demo reels of, of different movements for people that are just going to take themselves through it, but they want, you know, a well thought through program to take them through. And then also um, more than that is that there's a really good center community, you know, I, uh, on Facebook and, and, mm -hmm. and other things like I, these people, they're from all over the world, which is what's amazing. It's like these people just supporting each other from, from, from all over the world of like, you could do it. People posting their lifts and, you know, posting their runs and stuff like that. It's just, it's just a nice community to know yes. that I really do think there were so many terrible things that happened during the pandemic, but there are also a lot of like silver lining, good things that happened. Um, and I think virtual community is a big thing that that is a plus that really got enhanced for the through the pandemic because people wanted to stay connected and they and being being connected through fitness is is such a empowering 
awesome thing. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think honestly, and I, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast before, but the biggest thing we, we, we understood from the pandemic is the importance of social interaction, connection, um, and spending time with quality people. Now, whether that be like in person, which is why like, you know, when people were coming to the outdoor workouts during the pandemic, it was the highlight of their fucking day. Yeah. Not because it was such an incredible workout, which it was, but it was just the fact that that was the only opportunity they had to actually see people and to commune and to, to have some kind of social interaction. And as humans, we, we desperately need that. Like, yeah. We, we we go insane when we're alone. You only have to watch, like if you ever watch the series alone, um, you know, people go, people give up because they can't handle being alone. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, the pandemic left a lot of people alone, just alone with their, themselves, their thoughts, their, their um, the devil on their shoulder, um, yeah. all, of, all of their all of their vices came to, to the head. I mean, um, you know, we saw a huge uptake in alcohol, drugs, mental health issues, all these things, because people can't deal with being alone. Um, and I think any, whether it's, you know, in the gym or any kind of like app or um, like you were saying that the, the building is kind of like global community, anything that makes you feel a part of something where you can, you know, speak to people, uh, share in people's journey, share your journey with other people. Um, I just think that's so important and such a huge bonus to anything that, um anything that you're doing, like just, just following a workout on an app for yourself and running it down is one thing, but then sharing that workout and seeing other people's workout who are doing the same thing as you yeah. is a whole different, is a whole different ball game. And I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of the CrossFit um, style like apps that I see, I think the success of them isn't that there's great programming. I think the success of them is like, you can see how you do did compared to Dave in Australia. <laughs> yeah and it's yeah. just that like you know there's something nice about that like you, it's a i'm a human he's a human we did the same thing this is what he got this is what i got it's a nice you know um, a nice connection um that you get I that of it. and i love being able to reach people you know far yeah. and wide it's not just your small community but it's it's far and wide and you know i felt like i had something to say and you know, how hit, uh, fitness had helped me way back when, when I was having a hard time. And even, you know, speaking of the pandemic, it's like fitness helped me through that too. Got it, getting outside, going for walks and hikes. And oh, yeah. you know, sure. I had the luxury of having equipment at my house, you know, so I know a lot of people didn't. But I, my, my business totally took on a different form that I was training people in New York, Chicago, you know, from even in nice. LA, but virtually it's like, the fitness can be a, a, a very broad thing. And however that looks for you is how it looks. Like I do happen to love being in the gym. I love being around other coaches. Like I'm just a very social pack, you know, pack yeah. animal. So I getting yeah. back to the gym for me was, was pivotal, but it was also really interesting to see what, what I ended up coming up with in, in the face of diverse uh, adversity, like the pandemic, it's like, what I have these people's money. What am I going to do? And so that, yeah, that was very interesting to uncover that I was able to like maintain my business um, and turn it virtual. And now, yeah, with the center element, it's just gotten like global, you know, oh. it's pretty awesome. Well, I'm excited for you. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, I think it's going to put you on the map even more than you already are. And um, yeah, open up a lot of opportunities. Um, yeah. I wanted to touch on, I know we have this, this powerlifting meet coming up. I know you and Ruby have been programming it, executing the training for it. Can you tell everybody about it, what it is and what's happening? Yeah. So um, very similar to the barbell club that's already here with uh, Olympic lifting, we thought it would be time to, you know, Ruby is a competitive power lifter now as well um, in the newer stages of her power lifting career. And uh, so, yeah, she, she came to me and she was, had this interest and I was like, you know, I would love to help facilitate this journey for you because I, I did it myself. When I lived in Chicago, I helped put on two different mock meets. So I had this understanding of it, not to mention just the sport in general, having a big understanding of it. And then just seeing, yeah, the female, the female desire to like train and to learn. I, I, I think that females are a little more apt to get coaching because they're not afraid necessarily to ask for help like men might. 
There's you less know? ego. There's always less ego with women, for sure. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Just smarter. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so that's, it's, you know, everything starts with an idea and it was Ruby's idea. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And, and luckily you and you and Anne are just so open to all of us having good ideas that will benefit ourselves and our career in the gym ultimately, and more, most importantly, our students. So yeah, we're doing a, uh, it's a five day a week program that we write. But we see them in person for like a class structure twice a week. Um, so on Mondays and Fridays, and we lift together. And then the other days, they have to come in on their own and do their training because, you know, no powerlifting program is two days a week. I mean, it's like you have to put in right. that. Effort. And yeah, at the end of October, we're going to do a Halloween themed mock meet. So it's going to try it's it's, you know, a mock meet in that it is not sanctioned it is not official anywhere, but we're going to try to get it as official as it could feel and be. Yeah. And, you know, get a crowd in here and get some good, um, you know, donations going to a great cause. And so it just builds community. And that's what that's what fitness and lifting does. And yeah, largely, we have a ton of females, as it turns out, I mean, we have a couple guys, and we may have some people from the general public that come in and compete, which we hope. Um, because it, with these kinds of sports, it's like the more the merrier. And, you, and it is oh. such an incredible sport, too, because you know, get in, in the real powerlifting world, it's like you'll be lifting with a 16 year old and then afterwards, like a 75 year old who's just lifting the weight of the bar or not or lifting a lot of weight. And it's just so cool. It's just yeah. so cool. It's just like you're just competing against yourself and, you know, eventually you compete against others. But it's just That's an awesome community. And I think, you know, some, sometimes the intimidation can be, well, what if I'm not very good? What if people, what if people laugh at me? What if people don't think I'm good? It's like everybody at that kind of thing wants you to succeed. Yes. Everybody wants you to make that lift. No one is there to see you fail, nope. you know? Um, and I think once, once they do something like, like one of these meets, they get that feedback. They realize how positive it is. Oh yeah. It becomes addictive. And then it's like a very positive, a very positive addiction. Cause you're like, yeah. okay, now I see like, you know, it's the great thing about powerlifting and and weightlifting is it's small. It's small enough of a community to be not. It nothing's driven by money. Nothing's not. No one's making any money out of this. Why not? <laughs> it's, it's just. It's just about what you can do, and you know your own abilities and sharing those abilities with the world and people seeing you at your your best seeing you in that moment wanting you to do well them giving you their energy you giving them your energy and it being that beautiful kind of like um reciprocated uh relationship of yeah. on the day like applause of you you celebrating your strength and them celebrating your strength yeah. which is, i think is just such a you know such a joyful thing um when anything when anything becomes about money um, something gets lost, like it loses its, that, and to me, that's like small CrossFit competitions are one thing, big CrossFit competition, another, but like when CrossFit was just like a bunch of friends hanging out, like, <clears throat> um, competing against each other in a fun way, not for money, just because it was like something fun to do. That was the best time in that sport when like big money came in, big sponsors, all that kind of stuff. And it all became about like winning it loses something. Whereas the great thing about like, you know, at, at this level, powerlifting, weightlifting, it's really just about the joy of the sport um, and not about anything else, which is, you know, again, so, so refreshing and so pure. It um, is. Just awesome. a, there's nothing more pure than lifting a weight. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It seems, it seems so quantifiable. It's like you do it or you don't, you know, there's no right. way to be too <laughs> but and the then, people you meet along the way and the joy and the empowerment that you, especially for, I mean, uh, I'm nothing against males in the sport, but especially watching females go from this, like, you know, ground up and like this empowering, like standing tall with weight on your back and people are cheering. I mean, like what, what else is there? Right. And in a world which there are just so many distractions, so much anxiety, so many things that don't mean anything to be in a pure moment when all you have to do is take a weight from point A to point B is the most brilliant thing anybody yeah. can think of. Like, 
just well, the me, wonderful simplicity of it. The outside perspective is like, wait, so all you do is pick that up and put it back down one time, like, whoa, big deal. But what people don't realize and what they don't see is like all the time and energy and effort and right. accumulating to that moment, which is, it's truly the process that, that it really counts. Like that's, that's that moment in time where that person is doing that one lift because they just did it for five months or four months or three months, however they took to prepare. And it's like, it's the journey. It's, it's not like yeah. the destination. It was the journey along the way. You know? Well, and there's, there are just so many intangibles in life. And this is so tangible. Like yeah. I lifted 400 pounds. Like, yeah, it's a number. I did it. It's tangible. It's, it exists. It'll never go away. That happened. Yeah. Um, I just think that's very, that's a very like positive thing for people, a very like solid thing for people that they can, you know, and it's also a very relatable thing. Um, you know, to, to lift like 400 pounds off the ground. Most people will know what that, like they know what weight is and they know like lifting things, um, yeah. nothing like highly technical about it. Um, it's just like lifting something from point A to point B. And that's why people like, like to watch things like Strongman on TV because it's like, oh, that man just carried a rock from point A to point B or that man just dragged a truck from point A to point B they get it. It's like, Oh, I understand what that, that that's marvelous. And that um, sort of spectacle has been around for centuries. Like we talked right. about with the kettlebells and the strongman stuff. It's like for forever, people would come from far and wide and like watch this person on stage with like a crazy human strength to like lift this object in the air. It's clearly a part of like our nature as, as, as watching something like that. It's, it's right. a beat of strength. It's what you're yeah. doing, what not everybody else can or even would do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, that's that, that, the simplicity of it makes it more appealing because like I said, people can relate to it. Like the problem with, crossfit in terms of um viewers and people like spectating is they don't understand what's going on they, right. they can't relate to it so they don't know what doing 15 muscle ups and 20 ghd sit-ups and then 30 calories in the bike they have no concept of what that feels like whereas yeah. lifting an object from point a to point b or uh, like in football i have to get this strange shaped object from this point here to that point over there okay i get it like that's that's a very easy thing to follow and the same thing with with powerlifting the same thing with olympic with uh, weightlifting um it's simple enough that people can just appreciate it for what it is and they're not lost in all the kind of like skill and nuance of it it's just like a very basic thing so yeah. I think both as a as a as a sport for someone participating in it its simplicity is very pure and very rewarding and yeah. then as a viewer watching it it's like very relatable and very understandable which i think is important when you're you know, when you're, when you're doing a spectator event, um, yeah. which I hope a lot of people will come and watch because it's going to be fun. I like to think that they would, it'd be fun. I mean, <laughs> it'll be, it'll be a great little communal event. And, um, you know, if we play our cards right and we're already getting, um, requests for this club, the powerlifting club to continue. Yeah, um, so yeah. if all goes well, well, we'll do two to three a year and continue to do that and just like continue to bring people together and bring, bring, bring people to the platform. Well, I love it. And, and I love it because like I always said, I wanted Barros to be a theater in which great coaches can do great things. Oh yeah. It wasn't built for me to do personal training or me to teach classes or, you know, it to be like, um just a place for people to work out it was meant to be i knew a lot of talented people like yourself and it's like they need an arena in which to hone their craft and deliver their product and if we can build something that enables them to do that um then then we're onto something because great gyms need, need great coaches great coaches need great spaces um so, true. so stuff like the powerlifting course like the lift course like everything we do it's just it's the, the reward of it is in is is seeing the coach athlete response and seeing coaches do what they love to do and athletes to receive that passion and then execute. Yeah. Um it's 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 the honestly the best thing about owning a gym. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I thank you and I thank Ruby and I thank everybody at Ferris Athletic Club who, yeah. who who uses their talents to provide a service and to 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 spread that passion and to build that community and to share and you know it makes society a better place. It sounds like like hokey, but it does. It makes people yes. better. It makes so better. It, it and we didn't really even touch well, we touched a little bit on it, but this isn't just a physical thing. That the mental health benefits of mm -hmm. fitness and strength are so unbelievably powerful. Um, I just hope everybody gets to experience it because, um, you know, the happiest people I know are people that exercise regularly. Um, and it doesn't have to be strength training. It doesn't have to be powerlifting, but it's something. It's doing something. Um, and in a world where, like, we know, you know, the, the, there's a, the pharmaceutical thing, there's the health insurance thing, there's all these all these problems right now with like the way that we deal with uh, health and, and yeah. issues. But we have this amazing preventative cure called health and fitness <laughs> and yeah. strength training and, um, you know, cardiovascular, like everything that we do in the gym is to prevent you getting sick in yeah. both physically sick and mentally sick. Um, and if we can keep delivering that, then we're doing something worthy and meaningful and it's not just sets and reps. It's it's something crucial to the to the health of you know us as a human race. <laughs> and, and that's one of my storylines. You know, being in the medical industry before fitness is like I would see these people coming in with preventable diseases, and it seemed like almost the uh, unknowingly like the natural progression is to try to try to get to these people before they ended right. up in the ER. Like because because a lot of the things are preventable. I mean, some things are genetic or out of our control or accidents or whatever, but yeah, that was, that was part of what my journey and my story became, which was like, go from medical to fitness and try to get people to understand the value that, um, working out or just fitness, whatever that means to you before you end up in the ER with something that you could have prevented. Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, that's the message. Fitness, fitness is medical. Fitness is, yeah. Fitness will prevent you from needing the drugs that you will need if you don't do fitness. Exactly. I, I saw a sign once and I, I love it. It said, you know, spend the money on your health now or you will later, but in right. a way you don't want. You know what I mean? It's right. like yeah. you can second guess, oh, I can't afford this or I don't this or that. And it's just like, well, you're going to spend the money on your health at one point, but you might as well spend it being healthy versus like having to come back from where exactly. you got yourself to without it. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Jess, thank you so much. Um, love talking to you. Love everything about you. Thank you for all your hard work and everything you do at the club. Guys, if you want to uh, train with Jess, of course, you can come to the club. Uh, we are at 1316 Glendale Boulevard, Ferris Athletic Club. Um, we are also opening a new gym in Idlewild in 2023. I will get that open, I promise, by January, maybe before. Um, I'm trying my best. Um, but yeah, come down, see us, uh, train with us. Uh, Jess uh, has her own kind of signature class, uh, her own signature kind of kettlebell class that we're running called Hell's Bells. That's every Wednesday, uh, as well as, of course, all the powerlifting stuff and the personal training stuff and all that good stuff. Um, and we just have a ton of good coaches doing great things right now. So come down, check it out, check, check us out. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the club. You can also fill us, follow us online. We have a Fit30 program, which is a program you can follow at home or in your, in your local gym. Um, and in fact, you can follow all of our programs in your local gym. So check that out too. And until next time, take care and see you uh, down the road. See you.